In only a few days' time, the voters of America must decide who our national leaders will be for the next four years. Tonight, direct from Chicago, Illinois, George Bush talks to the citizens of this state, live and unrehearsed, so that you may know where he and Ronald Reagan stand on the critical issues of our time. Ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador George Bush. Thank you very, very much. I'm delighted to be here in Illinois. Ten days to go to this election, fired up, convinced in my mind that Governor Reagan will indeed be the next president of the United States. And let me say, let's go now to these questions. Don't hold back, fire away. Who wants to be first? There's one right here. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Yes, how has Jimmy Carter with the benefit of a Democratic Congress, managed to compound so many of the problems that face our nation during the past four years? That is what we call in the trade a slow ball. Uh, <laughs> you can see the seams on it as it goes across the plate. Look, Jimmy Carter invented something in 1976 called the Economic Misery Index. He added unemployment to, un to inflation. Nobody had ever heard of the Economic Misery Index. Uh, working people had their hopes up, People that were concerned about their inflation had their hopes up. Under Gerald Ford, when Carter came in, it was 12.5. It went up, 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 and in March of this year, it was 24 points, which was worse than at any time except the very depths of the Depression. Unemployment's up, inflation's up, interest rates are up, and Carter has failed. The way he failed, to answer your question is, he failed to chart a course for this country and stay with it. He vacillated. He gave in to political pressures. He never had the conviction to set a course for the United States and stay with it. Ronald Reagan, our program may have some ups and downs. Nobody's saying it's easy, but we have a vision. We have a direction for this country that's going to put America back to work, that's going to lower the taxes, that's going to encourage jobs in the private sector, and Reagan will have the courage to stay with it until we whip inflation. You watch. Who's next? We get one over here. Yes, welcome, uh, George Bush. The possib possible release of the hostages is the dominant news story of the day. Governor Reagan has said that the subject of the hostages is not an appropriate subject for debate during the current negotiations for their release, and most Americans agree with that. My question is, assuming the hostages are safely returned to their families, will Governor Reagan seek answers and give a full account to the American people as to how and why it happened and what he can do to keep it from happening again? Well, that's a very good question, sir. First, we do hope the hostages come out. And I don't think it should be a matter of partisanship, whether you're for rooting for the hostages to come home or not. Uh, we do believe that there are certain terms uh, that a country like the United States cannot pay. We don't want any of these people tried. We don't believe that you're going to go have an abject apology to somebody like Ayatollah Khomeini, who has fundamentally violated international law. Uh, we don't want to see ourselves involved in one side or another of a war which we ought to stay out of, the war between Iran and Iraq. But if those hostages come out soon, I am confident, uh, and then Reagan becomes president, I am confident that he would seek a full accounting. And one of the things he would do is to initiate and shape a defense policy and a policy for protecting our embassies and a policy for improving our intelligence so the United States will never be held hostage again. This is a disgrace to the United States of America. Here's one over here. Good evening, Ambassador Bush. We welcome you, and I'll tell you this. Uh, I have, on the lighter side, I know you're going to be in Washington, yeah. you and Mr. Reagan. And what? I'm, right now, I'm asking for two tickets to the inauguration vault. Is that your question? All right. 
right, my heavy question is this. Uh, you're you're going to be close to uh, the president and close to the people that are, uh, okay. well, the, the people that make the laws and uh, everything else. All right. What are you going to do for the real estate people? The housing industry is Good in question. shambles. The housing industry is driven to its knees. Two years ago, the average cost of a house, she's exactly right. Two years ago, the average cost of a house, and this sounds horrendous in this country, was $44,500. Today, it's $66,000. Two years ago, payments Two years, she's right. Two years ago, payments were averaged about 350. Now they're 550. Interest rates off the charts under Jimmy Carter. The way you get interest down is to get the federal government to live within its means. If we are operating, you know, Jimmy said, uh, our president said uh, in 19, I'm sorry, but I sometimes can't treat him presidentially. But uh, and I, I, and I apologize. I apologize. No. He, he is the president. He is, he is the president of the United States. But look, he said in a sacrosanct way, trust me, I'm going to get that budget in balance in 1980, believe me. And this year the budget is $65 billion in, in deficit, $65 billion. And that means that before you go to borrow money, ma'am, for a mortgage on your house or your kids do, you can't get it. Why? Because the government's in the head of the line borrowing $65 billion to pay to cover its debt or roll its debt over. You got to get the government to live within its means so young people can buy homes, so we can have the strength, the strength of America that comes from home ownership. By Reagan's economic plan of busting the back of inflation, you'll see interest rates come down and come down fast. Let's get some in the back. Yes, ma'am, right on the aisle. Good evening, Ambassador Bush. My name is Rita Mullins, and I live and work in Palatine. Okay. In our house, we have a saying for something that is not working. We say it's on the fritz. My question to you tonight Sounds is... Sounds like a vicious assault on Monday. I better... <laughs> After you are elected vice president, are we ever going to see you again? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, listen. This is a warm, friendly community, and I hope I come back, but not having to fix something. Uh, I, come, I hope I come back uh, to this part of Illinois with a little more hopeful, hopeful answer, because really people are hurting. And uh, I know what the expression on the fritz, we, we use it in our family, and people have a feeling that something in this economy and, and the whole thing is, is, is on the fritz. But I believe we can do better, and I'd like to come back when conditions are better, Frank. I'll come back if they're bad, frankly. I like it here, but I'd, I'd like to come back when they're better, when there is more hope out there. See, Jimmy Carter does this. He travels around the country and he says, there's a malaise in this country, meaning that there's a sickness in the country. I've traveled across this country for two years. There's not a malaise in the United States. Our institutions are sound. Our ability to produce is still there. There's a lack of leadership in Washington, D.C., and we want to change that. Can you get, I don't know if they can get you over there. Let's try this guy right here, he's been eager. Yeah, right here. I don't, can he reach you? Mr. Ambassador, my name is Paul Pearson in Deerfield, Illinois, and the question I have is, uh, um, I wondered if you could point out to the people herein if uh, um, just how the prosperity of a Reagan administration, which there will be, will lead to more peace in the world. I believe this deserves emphasis, and I believe that oh, you right. pointed out. All right, sir. Well, I have been disturbed uh, at these attacks on Governor Reagan as a person who would get this country into war. There's no evidence of that. Uh, every conversation I've had with him relates to being driven towards, towards peace. And you see, I believe that we don't have peace today. I look at Iran and Iraq at war. I look at Africa in turmoil. 45,000 Cubans bought and paid for by the Soviets in Africa. There were 18,000, mainly in Angola, when Carter came in. This hemisphere, the Caribbean in flames, all moving Marxist-Leninists, Guiana, Granada, and Jamaica, 
turmoil in Central, Central uh, America, 35,000 political prisoners in Nicaragua, our alliance with Brazil and Argentina weakened, NATO weakened alliances, not trusting us to keep our word, and then over in Southeast Asia, you see man's brutality to man, one million of eight million Cambodians killed, and not only Cambodia and Laos taken over by a Soviet-backed Vietnam, Thailand threatened. We're not at peace. There's no Americans are getting shot at right now, although 52 of them are held hostage. So what we think you have to do is redesign the foreign policy. And I believe that Governor Reagan and I can do it. We got to build a policy based on keeping the commitment. You know, foreign affairs isn't that much different than relations between people in business or neighbors or anything else. You got to keep your word of honor. You got to keep your sacred word of honor. That's the first thing. Secondly, you need to improve the intelligence capability of the country. Thirdly, you need to prudently restore those cuts in defense that Jimmy Carter made in the Ford budget. And you see, here's the problem. Carter came in and said in Notre Dame, you don't need to be worried about that fear of communism. Three years later, Afghanistan is invaded by the Soviet Union and he says, hey, I don't trust the Soviet Union, says Carter, three years into his presidency. It would not take Reagan three days into his presidency to understand that you don't trust the Soviet Union. Right over here, this guy. Ambassador Bush, I welcome you to the area. And my question is, we've been saturated with uh, President Carter's criticizing of Governor Ra former Governor Reagan's uh, character and um, other issues like this. I find it frightening myself to have a president go down to this level. What, and he does have, he's, uh, he's got the momentum going with him. What are we going to do about it and how are we going to combat against uh, his criticism? Good point. And I don't think that uh, that, that low level campaigning uh, that is going to pay off. And I'd, I'd argue whether the momentum is going. Yes, it was for a while, but the American people, uh, Jimmy Carter himself, had to say, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to have to get this thing. He didn't say this, but I'm saying it. Get it out of the gutter a little bit. And the reason is uh, he saw a backfire. People are fair, Democrats, independents, or Republicans. And when they see him doing as you properly say, saying Reagan's for war, or Reagan's going to divide this country, Christian versus Jew, or black versus white, uh, look, there isn't a bigoted bone in Governor Reagan's body. You can argue with him on some issue, but he's not a bigoted man. He's a compassionate man. And I think people know that. So my answer to your question is, there's an innate sense of fair play in the American people that are going to reject those, that kind of campaign tactic. I'm just not going to worry about it anymore, except I get mad inside. I get upset when I see a decent man attacked in a dishonorable way. Go after him on the issue, but not on the character. Right over there, yes sir. All right, ma'am, right here first, and then we'll go back, we've got two up. Oh, thank you, Ambassador. First of all, I want to congratulate you on having been selected by our Governor Reagan as his running mate. We're very delighted with that. Also, George... Thank you. George Kangas, whom I work with every day in this uh, uh, effort, uh, sent his very best regards to you. Now, my question to you is, or rather, I would rather that you comment on Governor Reagan's position in Israel and his position as far as the uh, embassy in Tel Aviv being uh, moved to Jerusalem, and what his plans are as far as uh, further ammunition, guns, and so forth uh, to keep a free Israel. Thank well, you. let me say that Governor Reagan gave a very perceptive speech uh, to the B'nai B'rith a while back. And for those interested, disproportionately interested in the Middle East, it's an excellent speech. It's a speech that recognizes and sets out the strategic and moral commitments that we have uh, to the State of Israel. It's a, it's, it's a speech that uh, rejects negotiating with international terrorists uh, until there's a renunciation of terror, until there's a recognition of the right of our ally, the State of Israel, to exist. In terms of the capital, you saw his statement the other day, he's not pushing to move uh, the capital at this instance because I think he recognizes that gets all caught up in the, in the peace process. But he does want to see uh, access to the holy places by all in Jerusalem. I believe in Governor Reagan we have a man who has a clear perception that a strong Israel, a com the commitments to Israel, uh, are in our own interest, you see, our own strategic and moral interest. My problem with the Carter administration, it gets a little off your question, which is a good one, but my problem with them is we tear up treaties 
with friends. As we back away from commitments, we shake up our allies. If we fail to keep our commitments in that part of the world, in this instance to Israel, other allies, like our NATO allies, are going to wonder, where do you stand? Or there, but for the grace of God, go I. I think under Governor Reagan, you're going to see a policy that recognizes this historic and strategic and moral relationship that's going to do what is necessary uh, to keep that country free and strong, and that answers your question uh, on the military side of it. Yes, sir, right back here. Yes, I'll be to you next. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jerry Sidorenko. I'm from Hoffman Estates. Uh, my question is, uh, what is Governor Reagan's policy towards human rights uh, concerning countries behind the Iron Curtain, and in particular, Ukraine. Well, Jerry, let me start by being somewhat critical, this won't surprise you, of the Carter administration on human rights. And the reason I'm critical is, first place, I don't think Jimmy Carter invented a morality in foreign policy. I happen to believe the United States has been a moral, decent country. May have made a mistake here or there, but a moral, decent human rights-oriented country for a long, long time, ever since our founding, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I fault the Carter human rights policy because of its hypocritical selectivity. We slap around our friends who do not measure up to our standards of human rights and yet move closer to countries that have no human rights at all. We voted to seat Pol Pot in the, in the United Nations, a Cambodian genocidist, if you will. The other day, we voted to seat him, not a word about the human rights, and we're silent in the face of human rights uh, violations that happened after the Helsinki Accords in Eastern Europe. And then we seem to go come down hard on, on dictators in this hemisphere who violate them. My view is this. We got to consider our strategic interests. We got to adhere to human rights, but we must not hypocritically, selectively apply our indignation. You see, that's the point you're trying to make. Right here. Oh, wait a minute. I got this guy. Sorry. Next and next. Yes. Ambassador Bush. Yes, sir. I am represent Asian American for Reagan Bush. Could President Reagan support the present regime in Korea? Or would he act to make it a more Democratic government. Well, let me simply say that Governor Reagan has a strong conviction about human rights, as I mentioned. We really believe in it. We believe that there should be standards, international standards that exist, should be adhered to. But what we also know that a destabilized Korean peninsula, a peninsula that, say, was destabilized by our doing what Carter said four years he was going to do, pull U.S. troops out of there, would leave South Korea as a sitting duck for an aggressive, vicious, total dictatorship, Kim Il-sung, in North Korea. We would want to see human rights. If we're aiding South Korea, and if South Korea is benefiting from loans from us, and to some degree they certainly have, they are a very productive country, and we want good relations with them, we would like to seek out and have them adhere to the highest possible standards of human rights. We also recognize that sometimes these countries have internal problems that are quite different uh, when you're over there than appear from here. So yes, we would work with the regime in South Korea. We would be pushing always for human rights, but we would not do anything to destabilize the Korean Peninsula and have South Korea taken over by North Korea because then you'd see the worst human rights violation in the, in the whole area, in all of Asia because Kim Il-sung is a brutal, cruel dictator who has no respect for human rights at all. That's my answer to that one. Just a minute, I, we, I, I recognize this lady, then we'll be down here. Yes, right in the middle there. Concerned about the health care delivery in our nation, I would like to know what plans your administration has to provide funds, especially in the areas of education and research in the various health care fields, so that we can raise the health care standards to better reach all the people in our nation. So important, and I'm glad you asked it because it gives me a chance to knock down a myth. There's a myth. Spread. I think maliciously by the opposition to the Reagan Bush ticket who says, hey, you better not be concerned because about them because they're going to knock off all spending to help people. That's not true. You know, you, you're, the area you're talking about, there is a legitimate role for the federal government. I want to see continuation of programs that work. 
We want to see more block grants that say to local areas and say to, say to states, we're going to give you more flexibility over how this works. But we will continue and enhance, because we've got a growing gross national product, programs that are doing exactly what you said. We care about education. We care about the indigent. All we want to do is find better systems of delivery. I think we can do much more research that would lead to much better utilization of home care, for example, instead of getting people into hospitals who are almost driven there by the government programs. We can do a much better job of home care, thus saving money in Medicare and yet being more efficient and having people cared for in an environment where they'll enjoy much more happiness. I want to see a shift away from the centralized programs, but I don't want to see a shift away from the compassion that, that frankly, your question evidenced to me, and it's very asking. We need to get some, we go one here, and then we got to get into the back of the room. Yeah, shoot, real quick here. I'm Dr. Kiriazopoulos, I'm the President of the United Hellenic Votes of America. Last election, we supported the President Carter, and he gave us so many promises, he never kept one. At this time, we support your ticket, sir. We'd like to know what you're going to do for Cyprus situation. Well, let me tell you. Hey, you got a good point. You know, we forget that Jimmy Carter made some 600. You haven't forgotten it. But uh, he made so many campaign promises. He really fouled up the campaign promise business for everybody. I mean, you just can't make a promise anymore because nobody believes you. We won't promise. We do feel that we have got to use our good offices to get that troop level reduced on Cyprus, to give the Greeks a, the, you know, a fairer shake there. We want to see NATO strong, and that means a strong Greek participation as well as having the Turks involved. I believe, I really believe, that Governor Reagan, with this strength towards his, his foreign policy goals, with the strength that he will project to our allies, and I consider Greece a strong ally, uh, that he can be a catalyst, without a promise, over promise, that he can be a, 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 a catalyst for getting that back to some fair play on the island of Cyprus. We all agree that there's got to be a reduction in the levels there, and, and I think he could work diligently for that. Way in the back, right here on the aisle, we haven't had one in the back, the poor, no, well, that's, that's all right, I had the other guy in mind, but go ahead. You know, <laughs> both are polite. We'll Ambassador both. Bush, in regards to um, our increasing uh, dependency on energy from the Mideast, what steps does the Reagan-Bush ticket uh, uh, plan to take to increase normal relationships with Latin American countries, specifically Mexico? Well, you're right that we need to improve relations with Mexico. It's got to be built on more than just, hey, you got a lot of energy and we want it. First, we want an energy program that is going to make us self-reliant in the reasonable future. It's not going to happen overnight. And that means we do not want continued dependence on OPEC oil. And that means we do need to do two things in the field of oil and gas. One, improve relations with producing countries like Mexico that are going to have substantial surpluses. China fits that description too. And, so, and also it means we're going to have to do better in this country on federal lands, 2%. The outer continental shelf has been explored for oil. We can do that and have a safe environment. Mexico, you're so right, is a key. And when Jimmy Carter went down to Mexico as the President of the United States and made that unfortunate reference that really people laugh about, but I'm telling you it was very serious, that thing about Montezuma's revenge as a President of the United States standing there with the chief of state of Mexico and making a comment like that and thus denigrating an entire proud people and culture. I'm telling you, that's not the way you go about improving relations with Mexico. And what we need to do is be... We need to be sensitive to their problems. We need to help them with, with our technology, develop industry along that border, which will help the immigration problem, we need to help them in the development to the degree they want us to, and we need to really feel and care about Mexico. And then I think you'll see the kind of relationship develop. We did recognize this gentleman back here. <laughs> nice try over there, though. Ambassador Bush, my name is Greg Politis. What response would you have selected to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan? Well, given the state of our forces uh, at the time, I don't believe, regrettably, that anything different could have been done. You see, in my view, you've given me the advantage of hindsight. In my view, we should not have permitted our relationship with Pakistan to deteriorate. In my view, if Jimmy Carter had done what Jerry Ford suggested uh, in his 
projection to cover these four years or five years of the Carter presidency, I believe that you could have deterred that kind of aggression. I believe that kind of aggression would have been, we can't guarantee it wouldn't happen, but would have been deterred because the Soviets don't want a war with the United States today. But if they see a pushover, if they say they can walk in and that nobody's going to respond at all, they're much more apt to do that. So I would simply go back to my answer that we've got to not threaten, not bully, always be willing to negotiate, but not pull back in a weakness position in terms of conventional force. I believe we should keep our relationships with Pakistan strong. I believe that we must have a way uh, to support, they call them guerrillas now. These are people that are fighting for their freedom in Afghanistan. And if we don't stand for them, if we're not willing to support people that are fighting against legion after legion of the Soviets, good heavens what's happened to the, to the principle of the United States is, is willing to stand up for freedom. I believe we'd have to redesign our, our whole policy. Right here, this little guy, one of you guys. Sir, will today's brutal Russification of the non-Russian peoples of the Soviet Union, especially the Ukrainians, be a significant factor in the signing of a SALT treaty? Well, it should be a factor, but, but that really comes under the heading of Helsinki and now Madrid, the question of human rights. SALT, we would have no objection to negotiating, as Governor Reagan said, on a SALT treaty. We object to the SALT II treaty. And Carter says, hey, if you're against SALT II, you're for war. And I say to him, how about Senator Jackson? He's a good Democrat. Senator John Glenn, he's a Democrat. Senator Russell Long or Bennett Johnson or Senator Hollings, all Democrats. Are they all for war? Is Senator Baker, Howard Baker for war? Kissinger or Bill Rogers or Gerald Ford? We all oppose the SALT II and we all strongly favor SALT III, a reduction in this nuclear madness that is totally verifiable. And that means, you see, we don't trust the Soviets to keep their word. And yet there are things they can do, information they can exchange, technological things that we can agree on that are highly classified that would let any skeptic know whether they were keeping their word or not on testing or whatever it is. We want a SALT treaty, but we do not want, want one that locks in inequity. The human rights thing should be handled through Helsinki and these other, other areas, follow on of Helsinki and these other. There's a frantic guy back here in the back. If I don't get him, he's gonna have a coronary and he's gonna break up our program. My name is Frederick Scoville and I'm from Schaumburg, Illinois. In reference to reducing or completely uh, uh, getting rid of inflation, yet maintaining our domestic programs, and at the same time cutting taxes, uh, how long do you think it'll be before we see you again here in Palatine? Well, it's gonna, I'll be working pretty hard, Fred, but uh, three, year, three years to get this budget in balance. You can do it. The federal spending is going to grow, but it's not going to grow as rapidly and recklessly as it has under the Jimmy Carter administration. We're going to take care of the poor. We're going to do things to help people, but we are going to eliminate the waste. We're going to cut taxes to stimulate jobs in the private sector, and we're going to offer hope instead of despair. I'll be back, and when I come back, Inflation will be less, interest rates will be less, and unemployment will be less, and you'll give me a warm welcome. Thank you all very, very much. We're out of time. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much.